Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We may have a few more uh, folks joining us. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carolyn Lamparella. I am the director of Preferred EAP, and I, I thank you for being with me today to talk about an issue that I think we do not spend enough time discussing, and that is sleep. Um, this this uh, webinar is a new webinar for me. Um, it involved a lot of research. Um, and even though I've, I've gained a lot of knowledge and, and information about sleep, I would not consider myself an expert. So, so this webinar is just an um, opportunity to introduce to you um, some of the concerns that we have related to sleep. What are some of the negative effects of sleep deprivation? Um, and also some basics about how sleep works and then hopefully give you some tips and strategies to improve your sleep or to um, if you have a loved one or a colleague or a friend who struggles with sleep uh, something that you can share with them as well um, sleep is so fascinating to me and one of the things that i have found really fascinating as of late about sleep is the stigma that is actually associated with sleep um, I, it's almost embarrassing to acknowledge when you get eight or nine hours of sleep, right? There's this, this notion that um, when we sleep that much, that somehow that means we're lazy or we're not as productive, right? And a hundred years ago, we didn't feel that way. This is really a, a modern phenomenon where we have given such negative connotations um, to individuals who actually really focus on sleep and, and spend a lot of time and energy getting good, proper sleep. That there is a stigma associated. You hear it all the time, you know, people bragging about um, how little sleep they need and how productive they are because of the lack of sleep that they need. Um, and that really has uh, damaged us. We are actually the only species on the planet that deprives ourselves of sleep for no apparent reason. There's no good, nothing positive comes from sleep deprivation, yet we so willingly engage in it. And so today, my hope is just to get you thinking about your own sleeping patterns, um, to really understand what could happen if you don't take the time um, to, to get good sleep. And uh, you know, hopefully, as I said, you'll walk away with some idea of how to improve your sleep. So to begin, what I thought it would be kind of fun, we have um, over 50 people on the call. I thought it would be fun to just survey, you know, everyone on the call. So we're going to do a few poll questions to start. Um, and my colleague Tyler is going to initiate that for us. Um, just to kind of, and again, these are anonymous, and this is just to kind of get an idea of, you know, some of the um, uh, the issues that you may be experiencing related to your sleep. Um, and so I have a better understanding of what is impacting all of you. So go ahead, Tyler, you can launch the, the first poll question. Okay, I have to shrink my screen. So what type of sleep schedule do you prefer? Are you somebody who likes to stay up late and wake up later in the morning? Or do you go to bed early and wake up early? Or do you have no preference? If you could go ahead and answer that, we'll take a moment to answer that question. And let me see, I guess if I do this, I can see, okay. So we have about 86%. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at that. Um, what are our results? So it looks like um, the highest percentage of folks like to go to bed early and wake up early. But there is a, 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 a over 36%, 36%, actually prefer to stay up late and wake up 
um, later in the morning. And this is actually, this is this does mirror the general population. There truly are night owls and morning larks as they are referred to. Um, it's interesting that 14% have no preference, which um, you know is great. That means you have some flexibility when it comes to your sleep schedule. We can move to the next poll question. Does your work schedule fit with your preferred sleep schedule? We have about 70% of the vote, 73. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this answer. This is actually good news that um, for, for the majority of you, 69%, your work schedule actually fits with your sleep schedule. But for those 23% who um, where your, your sleep schedule does not match up to your work schedule, that is something to really take note of, right? Because that is likely resulting in you not getting enough sleep. So this is a significant concern. You know, when your desired sleep schedule does not match the daily demands of your life. We can move to the next poll question. So how long does it take you to fall asleep? Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look. Um, this is actually uh, also good news that 40% <clears throat> say it takes 20 minutes or less. Ideally, if you are um, if you are in sync with your natural sleep schedule, it should not take you any longer than 20 minutes to fall asleep. So that is good news. But look at the percentage of folks who uh, take 20 minutes to an hour uh, to fall asleep this can become a problem for us. And again, it's something to pay attention to because really if you are sleeping well and sleeping according to your natural schedule, it should not take you any longer than 20 minutes. And there's a small percentage that actually say it takes one to two hours to fall asleep. So again, these are, these are things to be noting and paying attention to around your own sleep schedule. You can move to the next poll. I think we have two more. What do you do to help you fall asleep? So I'm sure there would be um, other answers than the ones I provided. Unfortunately, with um, GoToWebinar, we can only offer five choices, but this is actually not a surprise. It's good to see that there's about 40% of those on the call that do not require anything to fall asleep, that you just allow your body to fall asleep naturally, which is the ideal scenario. But there are a high percentage, 22%, um, who depend on sleep aids like melatonin or maybe sleepy time tea, 7% um, who require prescription sleep aids, 29% who watch TV or go on their phone are using electronics to help you fall asleep. We will talk about um, the, the problem with that strategy as we uh, move through this webinar. And I see a very small percentage meditate. Hopefully after participating in this webinar, that percentage will increase um, because meditation is a great way to bring on sleep. We can move to the next question. I think we have two more. 
Let's see. What type of challenges do you have with your sleep? Hard time falling asleep? Do you wake up frequently? Do you snore? Um, have a hard time turning off your thoughts? Or do you not have any trouble sleeping? guys are so great about answering these questions. I really appreciate it. Okay. So, you know, not a surprise again, the response is here. 47% have a hard time turning off your thoughts. And that is certainly true during this past year. We have seen an increase in overall stress. Our baseline stress levels have increased. And that, of course, has negatively impacted our, our sleep schedules and our ability just to turn our brains off and go to sleep. Um, another 12% have a hard time falling asleep. And then 24% wake up frequently and can't get back to sleep. And only 4% um, indicated that they snore. That's probably a question that's that's better for your partners um, to see if, if they agree with that. Um, often we snore and don't realize it if our partners are being kind and not telling us. But certainly snoring is um, an indication of uh, a potential sleep problem. So if you do struggle with snoring, it is something to really um, acknowledge and get and seek some some help around. We can move to the final question. How many hours of sleep do you get on average per night? This is the golden question. How many hours are you actually sleeping on average? You may get more on the weekends, but generally, you know, during the week, how many hours are you getting? Okay, great. So I'm glad to see that only 2% are sleeping four or less, 4%, um, four, four to five. Uh, but then we do, we have our highest percentage, 62 in the six to seven range. Only 12% are getting eight or more. And we have 21% uh, that are sleeping five to six. So it is, um, Conclusive, we are a sleep deprived group. The majority of folks on this call are struggling with sleep deprivation. And you may be telling yourself that six to seven is enough, but in reality, um, it actually is not as much as we need. Of course, there is some variability with folks, but generally it is recommended that adults get eight or more hours of sleep per night. So, so we will move on now to some of the negative effects of sleep deprivation. And I would like to begin with a video that talks about the mental health impact of sleep deprivation. So we'll go ahead and launch that. Next slide, okay, thank you very much. Um, Sleep is essential to actually help stabilize your emotional and mental health. And without sleep, the emotional circuits of your brain can become hyperactive and irrational. Um, allow me to demonstrate with a sleep deprived subject. Next slide. Because it turns out that we do video diaries with our participants throughout the deprivation night. And you go to meet one under the pseudonym of Jeff um, Jeff has just entered the study. It's 11.30 at night on day one. He's been awake for a perfectly normal 16 hours. And let's hear from Jeff what his sort of um, hopes and aspirations are for the deprivation period. Next slide. Hello. It's about 11.27 right now. Um, I've been here for about an, uh, I think about an hour. No. Yeah, about an hour. So it's the first hour. Um, 
I'm writing my paper right now, a uh, 30-page paper. Hopefully, I can get some of it done before I get too sleepy. So that's Jeff, um, a perfectly likable, affable chap who's hoping to get his 30-page report complete in a night of sleep deprivation. Classic delusional undergraduate thinking, I have to say. Uh, I see it all of the time in my students. Um, so, um, so sorry, can, uh, uh, so um, now let me fast forward the clock. It's now 5.30 the following morning. Jeff has now been awake for 22 hours straight, and instantly you'll notice one of the hallmark features of sleep deprivation, which is that you actually slide down in your chair. Um, Jeff, <laughs> just look around the room right now. Uh, Jeff is down about six inches here now. It's about an inch for every hour that you've been awake beyond a standard 16, um, based on our highly sophisticated machine learning algorithms. Uh, but in all honesty, notice just how emotionally different Jeff has become. And some people have rather unkindly described him as becoming a little bit emotionally unhinged. So, Let's, let's hear from Jeff how that 30-page report has been going. Um, and I do apologize uh, ahead of time for uh, the profanity. Hello. I'm very angry right now. Because I didn't get any fucking... Can I curse on this? I think, like... Whatever. <laughs> you probably think I'm crazy. I'm drunk. I'm very lucid, actually. So did you notice how Jeff went from being remarkably upset and annoyed that he got none of his 30-page report complete to then finding it almost hilarious? He was almost sort of punch drunk giddy on sleep deprivation and then came right back down to baseline again. That is a remarkably abnormal emotional distance to travel within such a short time period. And I think it emphasizes the type of um, destabilizing influence that a lack of sleep has on our emotional integrity. And we've gone on to discover what actually changes within the brain to produce this type of pendulum-like emotional irrationality. And there's a structure that sits uh, very deep within the brain. Next slide. Um, Hello. Next slide. <laughs> called the amygdala. And you can see it here in uh, the red colors. And the amygdala is one of the centerpiece regions for the generation of emotional reactions, including negative reactions. And when we looked at this structure in those people who'd had a full night of sleep, next slide, um, here in green, we saw a nice, controlled, modest degree of reactivity. Yet in those people who were sleep deprived, we saw this amplified, almost aggravated degree of responsivity. In fact, the amygdala was almost 60% more reactive under conditions of a lack of sleep. It's almost as though without sleep, we become all emotional accelerator pedal and too little regulatory control break, as it were. But what was more concerning, perhaps, to us was that this represented a neurological signature that was not dissimilar to several psychiatric conditions. Um, next slide. And we've gone on to discover links between sleep disruption and disorders such as depression, anxiety, including PTSD, schizophrenia, and tragically and most recently, suicide as well. In fact, over the last 20 years, we have not been able to discover a single psychiatric condition in which sleep is normal. So I think sleep may have a significant story to tell in both our understanding, um, our treatment, maybe even ultimately contributing to our prevention of grave mental illness. That's another one of our hopes as well. Thank you, Tyler. So we'll go back to the slides. So I really love that video clip because um, how many, we've all, probably everybody on this call has had that experience of emotional 
uh, swings that come after a night of sleep deprivation, right? Um, and, and if you have children who are in school and, and you, you've seen them pull those all-nighters or maybe you're, you yourself have pulled the all-nighters, you know what that feels like, um, the inability to manage your emotional reactions. You can move to the next slide, Tyler. But what I find so striking is what um, you know Matthew Walker is discovering is that the strong connection between mental health conditions and sleep deprivation. And, and what's really interesting is they are now discovering that the sleep abnormalities are actually preceding the diagnosed mental health conditions. And you know, when we think about our young people right now and the increase in mental health concerns that are impacting our young people, it makes sense because certainly our youth are incredibly sleep deprived, right? And that that is the result of many factors, including early school starts, right? There's research study after research study that shows that school districts that actually start school later, there's a really strong correlation with um, test scores, an increase in test scores, a decrease in aggression, a decrease in mental health conditions when we allow our kids to get more sleep. So this is something that is really important for us to be paying attention to, especially now during this pandemic, when we are seeing an increase in mental health concerns. You know, so we have to make sure that we're making sleep part of that conversation. Because um, truly, if we are able to improve our sleep, we are going to be positively impacting our mental health. You can move to the next slide. You know, some other concerns that we have are the effect that sleep deprivation has on our ability to learn and to remember things. Um, there's a part of our brain called the hippocampus, which is sort of like the inbox of our brain. That's where we see the most activity when we are learning um, new memories, when we're forming new memories. And we know now that we need sleep before learning. It sort of primes us for learning and we need it after learning. Um, for those who pull that all-nighter and they're studying all night and they never sleep, there's actually um, a 40% deficit in making new memories versus those who actually get a full night's sleep. So again, it's so important that we are structuring our lives um, especially when it uh, comes to learning in our kids, that we ensure that they are getting enough sleep. Otherwise, um, they're not able to form new memories, right? Those individuals who've gotten a full night's sleep, they measured the activity in the hippocampus, and they show that when they, uh, after that um, night of sleep, the hippocampus showed a tremendous amount of activity. But for those who are sleep deprived, there was literally no activity in this part of the brain that is responsible for forming long-term memories. So again, sleep deprivation is absolutely um, uh, uh, detrimental to our learning process. And again, we need to be thinking about this when it comes to our youth um, who tend to be so sleep deprived. We can move to the next slide. Sleep deprivation also impacts um, our cognitive abilities. We do know that as we age, um, our, our sleep quality declines. And it's not because we need less when we age, but, we're, but research is showing that um, as we age, we spend less time in deep sleep. Right, and so that is negatively impacting our, our memory and our cognitive abilities. We also um, know that during sleep, a very critical process happens. It's referred to as the glymphatic system. This is a system in, that exists in our brain similar to our lymphatic system that helps to clear all that chemical waste um, that uh, occurs, that cellular waste that occurs over the course of the day. Um, well, for a while, we didn't really know what happened in the brain. The brain actually sucks up about 40% of our energy during the day. So we know that there's a lot of cellular waste in the brain. 
And it was only recently that we discovered that what happens while we're sleeping is the spinal fluid actually acts as sort of like a, a flushing system and it flushes out our brains. And, uh, you know, the, our cells actually shrink while we're sleeping to create space for this to happen. But here's the kicker. It only happens when we're sleeping, right? So if we are depriving ourselves of sleep, we are not getting um, this clearing of cellular waste. And one of the um, uh, substances that it, it builds up in our brain is called amyloid beta. And it is associated with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Right. So so we do know that if we're not getting enough sleep, we are not getting the benefit of this clearing. And as this amyloid beta builds up in our brain, it negatively impacts our cognitive abilities. We can move to the next slide. So we also know that our immune system is negatively impacted by sleep deprivation. Um, the, so when we get enough uh, sleep, um, we see an increase in activity in our those killer cells that are a really critical part of our um, immune system. When we're not getting enough sleep, we see a decrease in these killer cells in our immune system, right? So um, there was a study that was done where it was just four hours of sleep deprivation per, per night. And I can't recall the, the, the amount of time, I think it was only a week where individuals were deprived of sleep for one week, and they actually showed a 70% drop in killer cell activity. So clearly sleep deprivation is, is negatively impacting our immune system, so much so that the World Health Organization classifies now shift work as a possible carcinogen, right? Because we do know that individuals who um, uh, are involved in shift work, unfortunately, tend to go back and forth between, um, you know, staying awake at night and sleeping during the day. And so their, their schedules are really out of whack and they are showing an increased risk of um, issues like cancer and, and other uh, diseases as well that result from this impact on our immune system. We can move to the next slide. Um, some other things that are concerning is there's actually a change in our gene activity. Um, so there was a study that was done that limited individuals um, to six hours of sleep for one week. And they showed that the genes associated with your immune system were actually switched off. And those that were associated with cancer, inflammation, and heart disease were actually turned on. So again, sleep deprivation really strongly impacts our gene expression, right? And, and if when we get enough sleep, we have enough energy for those, our immune system to work well. But when uh, we don't, we see this increase in, in gene expression around disease. We can move to the next slide. So let's talk about like, uh, there are many um, sleep disorders, but two of the most common sleep disorders that we often hear about are sleep apnea and insomnia. And sleep apnea is characterized by, um, uh, and, you know, usually snoring is a telltale sign, but it, what's actually happening is you're, you stop breathing for 10 seconds or longer during sleep. And you can have mild to severe sleep apnea and, and, if you, if you suspect that you have sleep apnea, it is really essential that you um, participate in some type of sleep study to evaluate how severe it is. Insomnia is something that is uh, far more common. We saw in our poll that we have a certain percentage of us on this call who have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, right? And that is um, considered insomnia when it is persistent. Most of us have uh, challenges on an occasion. I had one last night. Um, I'm sure it's because I was doing this webinar. I thought it was so ironic that I was having a hard time sleeping and here I am talking about sleep. So we all occasionally have those nights when um, we have a hard time sleeping or staying asleep. But you know, to really be diagnosed with insomnia uh, as a disorder, it would have to be persistent. You can move to the next slide. 
So what are some things that you should be aware of um, that might be indicators that you have a sleep disorder? Well, certainly if you fall asleep while driving, that is a telltale sign. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, one of the things we hear a lot about is drunk driving or driving under the influence. We spend a lot of time and attention on that, but almost 15% of fatalities um, when it comes to uh, car accidents actually are the result of drowsy drivers. So people who are sleep deprived and get in the car are actually more dangerous than those who are impaired with substances. And the reason is when, we, when an individual is impaired, their reaction time slows down. When someone is sleep deprived, what happens is they have these little micro sleeps that occur that could have that it could just be you know just a couple of seconds in that microsleep but during that time they are completely unresponsive and so drowsy driving is is a, a huge problem that we're not really um giving enough attention to if you are struggling to stay awake when inactive such as like when you're wa when you sit down to watch tv or you read and you immediately fall asleep I mean, if you have difficulty paying attention or concentrating at work, school, or home, if you're having performance problems at work or school, um, if you get told by others that you look sleepy or, or you, you look tired, there's actually some really interesting research that resulted in that whole notion of beauty sleep, right? Um, there was a study that was done um, where independent observers viewed pictures of folks who got a good night's sleep and those who didn't get a good night's sleep the observers did not know which group was which, but they were able to say that the individuals who were sleep deprived just didn't look good. They didn't look healthy. They didn't look well. Um, we can see it in our face, right? And so that whole idea of getting your beauty sleep is a real thing, right? So if, if you're often being given feedback that, geez, you look tired today, you know, are you okay? Is everything okay? You may be sleep deprived. Um, if you're having difficulty with your memory, if your response time has slowed down, if you're having a hard time controlling your emotions, like the individual in the video, if you notice that you're just more reactive than you typically are, um, it could be related to your sleep. If you have a compelling need to take a nap almost every day, um, and I'm not talking about the short naps, like the 10 minute naps, because um, that is a common question that I get when I talk about sleep. Are naps good? And they actually are very helpful to give us that boost that we need later in the day. But if you're finding that you are sleeping an hour to an hour and a half um, every day, that's an indicator that you're not getting enough sleep, that you might be sleep deprived. You can move to the next slide. So, you know, what I've mentioned this already, you know, how much sleep do we actually need? Teenagers need more. Um, obviously, infants and young children need even more than teenagers, but teenagers need at least nine hours. Adults, it's recommended eight to nine hours of sleep. Um, and, and as you can see on average, the majority of us are, are getting six and a half hours or less. Now that may not seem like a really big deal to you, right? You think, ah, six and a half, what's the big difference between six and a half and eight? Well, let's move to the next slide because we go through this experiment twice a year, right? Once, one, one, um, time of the year we're actually losing an hour of sleep and one time a year we're gaining an hour. And as you can see from this slide, when we lose that hour, we see a jump in heart attacks. That's just one metric that is looked at. If you look at other metrics like car accidents and some of the other concerns that I've talked about, you can see that just losing that one hour of sleep is hugely detrimental for us. So even though it seems like, well, geez, I'm getting at least six hours, that's gotta be good enough. When you need eight and you're getting six, the negative effects on your body can be profound. As you can see, when we gain that hour, we see a 21% decrease in heart attacks, right? And just gaining one hour for students, for kids, just delaying school one hour, 
has so many positive benefits. So it is really important that we connect with um, what our body truly needs when it comes to sleep. Of course, there is some variability, right? I mean, we're not all of us are the same, but the majority, the vast majority of us as adults need that eight hours of high quality sleep. Now let's move to the next slide. And I wanna talk a little bit about the mechanics of sleep um, and what governs our sleep. So the, the, um, the, the feeling of sleepiness and wakefulness is governed by our circadian rhythm and hormones within our body. And I know this is a dense slide, I apologize for that. But I, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that we're all sort of paying attention to this natural rhythm that we have in our body, this circadian rhythm. And as some of you indicated, you know, for some of you, um, your sleep schedule tends to be earlier where you're waking up earlier and going to bed earlier. And for others, it's staying up, um, waking up later and staying up later. You know, so your circadian rhythm, there is some variability around it but it's basically governed by light. Light exposure is what signals our circadian rhythm and the release of hormones in our body, right? And in particular, over the course of the day, there's a, um, a chemical a hormone, adenosine, that builds up over time. So the longer we are awake, the more adenosine builds up in our body and it creates what is referred to as a sleep pressure, right? And so that's why over the course of the day, we start to feel um, more sleepy. That is the result of this adenosine building up in our body. Let's talk about caffeine for a moment and why caffeine can be so helpful in waking us up, but also so detrimental in allowing us to go to sleep. Caffeine actually blocks the receptor. So in our brain, we have this lock and key system where um, our nerve cells communicate with one another. Caffeine blocks the adenosine receptors, right? And so what it does is it prevents that adenosine from building up, right? So, so it delays that feeling of sleepiness. But many of you who are addicted to caffeine, myself included, I am definitely drink way too much coffee in the morning. I experience that dip when the caffeine starts to wear off, then all of a sudden the adenosine just sort of floods, you know, into those receptors, almost over accommodates and you get that strong feeling of sleepiness, right? That is the result of that wearing off of the caffeine. Now, for many of us, we think, well, if I drink caffeine in the morning, it shouldn't impact my sleep later on. But in reality, it takes about 14 hours for that caffeine to completely leave your system. So if you are drinking caffeine later in the day, you are blocking your those receptors from that, that buildup of adenosine. So you're impacting your sleep pressure and, and delaying your sleep. Another thing that happens, you know, during sleep deprivation um, is we see this increase in a hormone called ghrelin, which um, is associated with hunger, right? And so this is one of the reasons why when we are sleep deprived, we tend to crave those carbohydrates and sugar, right? We want that, the, that sugar um, when we're tired. It's because this ghrelin increases in our bloodstream. Another thing that happens is, you know, that, that is um, the result of light exposure is the release of melatonin. And some of you indicated that you do use melatonin um, as a sleep aid or maybe sleepy time tea. Um, and melatonin for some people can be effective, but the, the problem with uh, melatonin as a supplement is it's not well regulated um, and it is a hormone. So it does disrupt other processes within our body. In particular for children, it delays puberty because it is a hormone. It suppresses hormones that bring on puberty. Um, so it's something that you want to use with caution and with under the guidance of a physician who is well versed in supplements. Um, but what happens with melatonin 
is it's released at nighttime, right? And, and so the release of that melatonin helps to bring on sleep. And then in the morning, when, the, when it's light out, the melatonin gets absorbed, right? And so for teenagers, what we know is that this process shifts. So um, melatonin is absorbed much later in the morning and it's released later at night, which is one of the reasons why teenagers gravitate toward that night owl schedule. It is very much connected to their hormones um, and the way their circadian rhythm works. You can move to the next slide. So let's talk about when we fall asleep. What does our sleep cycle look like? What's actually happening when we fall asleep? Um, so we talked about the circadian rhythm, but when we are sleeping, we actually see something called the ultradian rhythm, which is about a 90 minute cycle. And as you can see from this graph, we experience several um, ultradian rhythms throughout the night. Uh, they, they tend to be about 90, 70 to 90 minutes, and that completes one cycle. So when we first fall asleep, we slowly, um, this is when we uh, go into, you know, gradually move through stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. Stage three and four are considered deep sleep. This is what happens to us in the beginning of our night when we first fall asleep. We go um, down to the art into deep sleep, and then we gradually come back up and experience um, something called rapid eye movement. And this is the time when we are dreaming. Most of you are familiar with other sleep is called non-REM sleep. REM sleep is the time when dreams occur. Early in the night, we spend less time dreaming. And over the course of the evening, the longer we are asleep, the longer these REM periods um, become. So the first period of REM is less than the final one at the end. Now, this happens over the course of the evening, and our body is constantly cycling through these stages. Now, let's go back to daylight savings time for a moment and think about delaying you know, or, or losing that one hour of sleep. As you can see from this diagram, that potentially could result in a whole loss of a period of REM sleep. And what we know is that REM sleep is absolutely critical for our well being. We, there's still that we don't know about dreaming, right? Those of you who have a mental health background, we learned about dreaming by studying Freud um, and much of what he believed has never been proven right? It's just theory. But we do know that there is tremendous activity going on in our brain during these periods, and we are beginning to associate certain things with REM sleep. You can move to the next slide. And so a few, I just want to highlight a couple of things that are going on during this REM sleep. One, this is the only time during the day um, when adrenaline is blocked. So adrenaline, noradrenaline, is what we most associate with stress, right? It's the hormone that gets released in our body that creates that feeling of stress. It helps us contend with stress. Well, during REM sleep, this is actually blocked, right? And it's one of the few times um, during the day. It's the only time during the day when, it, when um, adrenaline is completely blocked in our body. So you can imagine how potentially restorative that REM sleep can be for us, right? Um, we also now, there's, there are many studies that are associating dreaming with processing traumatic events. Um, we, when in studying individuals with PTSD, one of the things that we're seeing is they have disrupted REM sleep, right? And so the theory, the idea is that when we are dreaming, like reliving past trauma and dreaming about it, we are now processing that memory without that stress hormone present, right? So it gives us an opportunity to recalibrate our emotional experience without the stress hormone. 
And, and, and they're actually seeing there's some, um, Matthew Walker was uh, instrumental in developing um, some research that showed there was a, I, I don't recall the, the drug that was given, but it was a drug that was previously given to individuals for blood pressure. They actually found that when they gave it to individuals who were um, experiencing PTSD, what the drug did is it blocked noradrenaline in their body, the, the release of adrenaline. And they showed that that resulted in individuals with PTSD dreaming more frequently. So it restored their REM sleep. And when they woke up and they had those same memories, it did not have the intensity that it had prior um, to receiving this medication. So there is a strong correlation between dreaming and emotions. Another really interesting study that was done is, you know, they, they um, actually had a group of individuals that where they blocked their REM sleep and those who had normal night sleep. And they were shown images of different emotional responses, different like faces with different emotions. And what they found is that individuals who had disrupted REM sleep were unable to read the emotions accurately, right? So they started to read facial expressions negatively when they really weren't negative. Um, and so they had a hard time understanding the emotions in other people. Now think about certain professions like, um, you know, healthcare. You know, let's say um, and, uh, we have a sleep deprived healthcare provider or maybe a police officer and their job is to read the people that they are interacting with, read their emotions, right? If they get it wrong, the potential to miss very important information is really high. Right? So REM sleep is really important. And again, it's one of the reasons why Six hours, not the same as eight hours, right? So let's move to the next slide. So now I want to end quickly with um, uh, some tips for getting better sleep, okay? And there, there are a lot of him, uh, a lot of tips here. I'm going to go through them. We don't have a tremendous amount of time, so if you have questions about any anything I'm presenting, please go ahead and put them in the question section. Um, and we'll do our best to get to them. If I'm not able to get to everything today, I certainly will um, answer those questions in the future. But some tips for getting better sleep. First and foremost, maintain a regular schedule. And this also applies to shift work. If you are, I mean, obviously we depend as a society on shift work, right? We can't run a hospital system without night shift. Many companies aren't able to operate without night shifts. So shift work is an instrumental part of our society and we depend on shift workers. One of the best things a shift worker can do is maintain the same schedule for as long as possible, um, rather than going back from sleeping, you know, during the day and sleeping at night. That is hugely disruptive. Another thing we can do is exercise earlier in the day. This sets the hormones um, up right from the beginning because we get that release of cortisol early in the day and that helps to set our circadian rhythm. And as I said, avoid caffeine and nicotine. Those are stimulants later in the day and do your best to avoid alcohol as, as and at a minimum, make sure you're not um, drinking alcohol close to bedtime because we do know that it robs us of REM sleep and it causes you to wake up frequently throughout the night. Avoid large meals and beverages late at night. Again, our, our, our circadian rhythm depends on these physiological signals. And so if we're eating late at night, then it, it's sort of sending the message to our circadian rhythm that it's not time for sleep yet. So you wanna time your meals um, in around your sleep schedule. So if you're trying to go to bed earlier, you wanna eat earlier. And certainly avoid medicine that delays sleep. If you are on prescription drugs, make sure you ask that question. How is it going to impact your sleep? I have a client who is on a medication um, for bipolar disorder for years and years and years. 
And never once did his doctor tell him to take it earlier in the day because that might disrupt his sleep. And like 10 years into taking this medication and 10 years of sleep, sleep deprivation, he sort of experimented with it on his own and his sleep improved just by taking that medication earlier in the day. So make sure you're asking your doctor about that. And if you need to take a nap, Make sure it doesn't happen after 3 p.m. unless you're somebody who goes to bed really late. Um, but try to keep it short in duration, 10 to 20 minutes. And the reason for that is going back to that ultradian cycle, that 90 minute cycle. If you're sleeping for an hour, then you're allowing your body to go into a deep sleep and you're waking up sort of mid cycle. Right, and so that results in you feeling really groggy. So if you if you take a full 90 minute nap, you haven't completed that cycle. But if you only do the 10 to 20, then it doesn't give your body a chance to go all the way into a deep sleep. It just gives you enough to restore you. You can move to the next slide. So another and very important strategy is to relax before bed. Don't be engaged in full activity, lights on, lots of things going on, and just jumping into bed and trying to turn the lights out, right? You want to have about an hour of prep for bed so that you have a good eight hours of high quality sleep opportunity. Right. If you jump, if you try to go from high activity right into bed, it's going to take you a while to fall asleep. So have a wind down routine. Take a hot bath. When you get out of the bath, the resulting drop in your body temperature is going to make you feel sleepy. That's what happens at night. Our body temperature rises throughout the day. And then as um, the day progresses, it slowly decreases and that brings on that feeling of sleepiness. Another reason uh, to keep your bedroom cool, because again, our body needs, our body temperature needs to decrease in order for us to fall asleep. Reduce light exposure, make your room dark, limit your exposure to light. All of you who watch TV and are on your iPads or phone, even when, even if you are wearing those blue light filters, you're still getting exposed to light. And it does shift your circadian rhythm, right? It delays the release of melatonin. So using that as a strategy to fall asleep, what you're actually doing is delaying your sleep, right? You might feel like you need that. It has become a habit, but if, if ever possible, try limiting that to an hour before bed so that for a full hour, instead of reading from your iPad, reading a book or doing something that has less light exposure is really important. Another thing you can do is get light exposure first thing in the morning. And ideally it's stepping outside. This helps to set your circadian rhythm you know, it, it sort of like starts the timer, right? If you step outside and you get sunlight for about 10 minutes, so it's a great time to go for a walk, to sit outside, um, just stand in the doorway, just allow your eyes to get exposure to sunlight. That helps to set your circadian rhythm in motion so that the clock is ticking and by the end of the day, you're gonna be sleepy when you're supposed to be sleepy. Another strategy is, Make sure you, know, you have a comfortable mattress and pillow. Don't have the clock facing you, turn it away from you. If you wake up in the middle of the night, do not look at the clock because that just stimulates anxiety. Um, and don't lay in bed awake. If you're, if you're in bed, if you wake up in the middle of the night and it's been more than 20 minutes, get up out of, out of bed, do something relaxing like meditate, read a book or just sit in a dark room and wait for your body to naturally become sleepy before you get back into bed. Our bodies are association machines, right? So the more you lie in bed awake, the more you are associating wakefulness with your bed. You want to have a strong association between sleepiness and your bed. Okay.
those are lots of strategies, lots for you to try. Um, I want to pause now. We don't have a tremendous amount of time, but in the last five minutes, I'm, I'm just curious if there are any questions, any comments. Uh, Tyler, let me see. I think I have the ability to see questions. Let me see. Oh, there's lots of them. Um, let's see. Tyler, would you be able to read them for me? I'm having a hard time seeing them again. They're really compressed. Tyler, are you still with me? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Sorry. Um, Any questions, Ed? Yes. So um, one that just came in actually was, what do you think about acupuncture for helping with sleep? You know, I don't, I don't know with certainty. I've not read much about that. I know personally, I have used acupuncture to treat um, allergies and, and it was very successful. I think it's worth investigating. Um, it doesn't hurt, you know, to give it a try and see if that can help. I mean, it is associated with relaxation and a decrease in stress. And I think if that is the result, then that may wind up improving your sleep. So I think it's definitely worth giving it a try. Okay. Um, another one that came in was, um, what about um, frequent you know, trips to the restroom and urges like that every two hours or so at night? Yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, this could be an issue of um, or, or an indicator of a, a other health issue, like uh, for men, it might be something related to your prostate. I mean, ideally, try not to drink liquids, you know, before bed. I mean, wait, make sure there's an hour at least between the last time you had something to drink to decrease that wakefulness. Um, but if that is a persistent problem, then it might be an indicator of another health condition. And so certainly it, it should be discussed with your doctor. Any other questions? So um, a lot of the other things that have come in, it seems like you've touched upon during the presentation. Um, okay. About the association with um, sleep deprivation and dementia. Mm-hmm. Um, and also caffeine, you know, how much is, is too much and, and how long did you stop eating or drinking, you know, anything caffeinated before before sleep, which I think you just touched yes. upon. I'm seeing, okay, let's see. Um, just looking through these. Yes. I, I did see somebody did indicate that um, they've used acupuncture and it and it worked better. Now, I intentionally did not spend a lot of time talking about sleep medications because that is definitely not my area of expertise. Um, what, I, what I have uh, read about sleep medications is they um, are considered depressants um, or sedatives. So they actually are suppressing systems in our body just like other um, uh, uh, suppressant medication, like, you know, medication for anxiety, like Xanax, things like that. They suppress our system. So they actually do not bring on natural sleep. So if at all possible, it is far better to try some other strategies to help you fall asleep um, and, and make medication a very last resort and do it under the guidance of your doctor because there, there, you know, we definitely have seen some negative side effects to some of these medications. So you want to use them with caution. Um, and again, that's not my area of expertise, but I, I strongly encourage you to have that conversation with your doctor. So one of the things I'd want, I wanted to close with, um, and then certainly if you have to drop off, that I, I have a five minute uh, meditation that I'd like to share with you. There's a, a type of yoga called Yoga Nidra, and it is um, a type of yoga that is associated with sleep. And the intention behind Yoga Nidra, this type of meditation, is to help bring on sleep. So you may not be in a position where you can lay down or fall asleep right now, but I wanted to at least expose you to an alternative um, to sleep, other sleep aids, you know, meditation, it, it just, 
it primes us for sleep, right? Because it slows our brain waves down and it gets us ready, right? It's all that preparation that we do before we jump into bed that is so critical because we wanna make sure that we have a, a window of opportunity for sleep that involves at least an hour of preparation. And so this is something you can also do in the middle of the night if you wake up. Um, and have a hard time falling back asleep. I would encourage you to, to experiment, you know, with some of these um, meditation exercises and in particular one that is um, considered yoga nidra. So with that, I'd like to close with this. It's about five minutes um, and I thank you for your time. If you have additional questions, please go ahead and put them in. Um, I'll take a look at them um, after we're done with this meditation. Tyler, you can go ahead. Before we begin Yoga Nidra, lie down on your back, resting your hands by the side of your body, your feet slightly apart, and close your eyes. Just begin by taking a few slow, gentle breaths in and out through the nostrils. And now relax the breath completely and allow yourself to become completely still. Begin by taking your awareness to your right foot. Right knee. right thigh and hip. And to the whole of the right leg. Take a deep breath in. And let go. Take your awareness to your left foot. Left knee. Left thigh and hip. And the whole of the left leg. Breathing in and slowly breathe out. Become aware of the abdominal region and the stomach. The chest. throat, now take your awareness to your right arm, your left arm. the head, the face, become aware of the whole body.
whole body. The whole body. Take a deep breath in and as you exhale become aware of all the sounds around you. Become aware of your body. And keeping your eyes closed when you feel ready to you may roll over to your right side and gently make your way up to a comfortable sitting position. And when you feel ready, you may gently and slowly open your eyes. So hopefully some of you were able to, I see that we still had a, a good number of folks who were able to stay on. As you know, it's it's clear that the Yoga Nidra is um, uh, very much focused on body awareness and uh, similar to a body scan for those of you who meditate. Um, so I encourage you to experiment with uh, different meditations that might help bring on sleep. I do see a couple of additional questions or comments um, that I want to make sure to address. What about reading in bed? That always puts me right to sleep. That actually is a good strategy as long as you're not reading on an iPad. Um, that There was actually a study that Matthew Walker talked about comparing uh, folks who were reading a, a book versus reading um, from their iPad and reading from an iPad or a Kindle did delay their sleep, delayed the release of melatonin. So reading from a book is actually really um, helpful. Uh, nine, uh, uh, the question of is nine hours really needed to get eight hours of sleep? Yes. So you, so again, we talk about the opportunity for sleep because during the night there there are periods of wakefulness, and hopefully it's it's waking and then going right back to sleep. But um, that's why that wind down routine is so important so that by the time you are laying in bed and ready for sleep, you have that full hours of eight hours of opportunity um, to get a good night's sleep. Um, so I don't think I'm just kind of perusing the questions again. It doesn't look like we have any additional questions, but so that's all I have. Hopefully this gave you a good introduction to, to thinking about your own sleep, um, some strategies to try to implement to improve your sleep or to, to recommend um, to your friends, colleagues, loved ones, because really, truly, we do not give sleep enough attention. Um, it is important for us to overcome that stigma and, and start viewing sleep as our best defense against everything that ails us, right? There is nothing like a good night's sleep to help us restore ourselves and prepare for the next day. It is by far the best thing that we can do to take care of ourselves. As always, you can certainly reach out to Preferred EAP if you want more information. Or um, if, you'd, uh, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to Preferred EAP. You can ask for me directly. I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with me. I hope you have a great day and a good night's sleep. Thank you so much.